Good morning, Eastgate. Ray, I think you're the only one, man. You got to get them fired up this morning. <laughs> there you go, man. Hey, let's stand together. It's good to be back. Amen. And uh, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Good to see everybody online. I'm waving at you. And uh, we're glad you joined in with us this morning. But let's just praise the Lord together. Jesus. 
is yours. Sing it out. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all. Take it all. My life in your hands. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all. Take it all. My life in your hands. Lay down my life. Take up my cross. You are my God, whatever the cost, Jesus, oh Jesus, my heart is yours, my heart is yours, take it all, take it all. again all to Jesus all to Jesus I surrender all to you I freely give oh I will ever love and trust you in your presence I will live my heart is yours Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. My heart is yours, my heart is yours. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. Oh, take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. You guys hear me out there? Iffy? That's all right. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning at Eastgate Church in Nazarene. Thank you for joining us live, whoever's up there joining us. A couple things I wanted to talk about. Can you guys hear me yet? Yes? Okay. All right. So a couple things I wanted to talk about. Coming up tonight, we have a celebration of life service for Kenzie Byers. Tonight at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. You guys feel free to come. We do ask, just like as we're having service, please socially distance and please wear a mask if you have one. We are not requiring it, but we do ask you to. Another thing, VBS, we have changed a couple things with Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School was supposed to be two whole weeks. We changed it. It is no longer coming up this week, but next week. It will be July 27th through the 31st. That week, we will have Vacation Bible School for all ages. If you guys haven't signed up yet, you can sign up on our Facebook page for our kids, which is Encompass Kids on Facebook. You guys can feel free to um, email Kat to sign up for that also. If you guys are interested in volunteering, please let us know. We will find somewhere for you to volunteer. The last thing is tithes and offerings. We ask that you guys that are online, your link should be popping up on the bottom of the screen. If not, it's eastgatenaz.com backslash give. And for those of you in-house, we have um, offering plates at each exit for you to drop your offering in. We thank you and we appreciate that. Last thing I just wanted to speak a little bit about is uh, Greg preached two weeks ago on freedom. And freedom of our sins. And I started this new curriculum with the youth this morning on freedom. And I asked them to describe what freedom was. And simply put, freedom is Jesus. Amen? Freedom is Jesus. Freedom is the Son. The love that comes from God. So this morning as we're worshiping, remember that love that comes from God. Remembering who you're worshiping. 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come to your house, God, to come to your house and praise your name. Lord, I pray that you would fill this place, Lord. May we proclaim our love for you in worship. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you're in the house, would you stand with us again as we continue to worship this morning? still doing great things. He wants to do that in your life. Amen. Amen. 
This next song just talks about God's love for us. Would you sing it with us? spoke a word or you were singing over me or you have been so so good to me before I took the breath you breathed your life in me
seated this morning. Amen. Aren't you glad for the never-ending love of God? I, I don't know about you, but it says God's love is reckless, and that song right there, can I tell you what? I don't think God's ever, love is really ever reckless, but it's intentional. God loves us more than we can even begin to imagine or ever think or ever consider. This morning, I just want to open up with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace. Lord, today I want to thank you for your comfort and your mercy. Father, right now, more than anything, Lord, we need the power of your anointing. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would fall fresh upon this place. Lord, not upon the building, but us as individuals. Father God, from those who are sitting here in the sanctuary to those who are sitting in their living room. Father God, I pray that over these next few moments, Lord, that there be no distractions. Father God, but with clarity, we would hear your word today. Father God, I pray that you would show up and you would show off in only the way that you can. For you are a miracle working God, and we believe that. And Lord, we believe that you're going to do great and mighty things in this service today. Lord, would you have your will, and Lord, would you have your way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been in a series now. This is on our sixth week. It's called Realign, talking about how God wants to realign our lives First, we started talking about our spiritual life, how God wants to realign our life spiritually. We've looked at emotional health, mental health. We've talked about stress and physical health and all these different things. Today, we're going to be talking about healthy relationships. You know, God really began relationship with humans when it started really back in the garden. And back in the garden, uh, God created everything and he said it was good. Now, today, things aren't quite the same way they were when they were in the garden, are they? As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to talk about facing the fears that ruin relationships. You see, originally God had created everything in the garden, and he said it's good. Now, I believe that he created Adam, and Adam was sitting around, and Adam was probably kind of lonely in some ways if you think about it. As Adam had a job to name every animal, he began to notice something. Every other animal has a mate, but Adam said, you know what, I really don't, I don't have a mate. And so God said, you know, Adam, you're right. And I believe as God looked around the world and he looked at all the animals he had created and he looked at Adam and he said it's good and he looked at Adam again he goes, you know, Adam, you're good, but I think I can do better. All you women, go ahead and smile. I'll get you back later. I'm just kidding. But God had taken the dirt of the ground and out of the dirt of the ground he created Adam. But out of Adam he created Eve. Now, this is probably why men don't mind getting dirty, but women don't like it. Think about it for just a moment. Men, you were created from the dirt of the earth. Little boys don't mind getting dirty. I, I can remember as our boys have been growing up over the years, and uh, we would go to uh, Stacy's grandparents in uh, North Carolina on the farm down there, and they would have these huge mounds of rocks and places and things pushed up, and uh, and, and the boys, they couldn't wait to go just run and play in the rocks. I'm like, they're going to get filthy. And Stacy would look at me and say, it's okay, they're boys. Let them get dirty, we have a washing machine. You see, and men don't mind getting dirty and messy. But you see, there's a symbolism here that I want you to see when we start talking about Adam and Eve. You see, God created Eve as Adam's helpmate. And it said that Eve was taken out of Adam's rib. Now, I want you to notice something. Eve was taken out of a rib. She wasn't taken out of his feet that Adam would walk all over her. And she wasn't taken out of Adam's head that he would lord over her. As a matter of fact, it says she was taken from his rib because God created them equal in his sight. He loved them both so they could be mates. And the reason I believe that Eve was taken from his rib was because it was very close to his heart. And you know what? Men, your wives should be so close to your heart. You should have a love for your wife. That surpasses all things. The only greater love will be for the Lord your God. You see, and I want you to understand something. When, when, when Adam saw Eve for the first time, could you imagine when he woke up and 
He had seen all the animals of the world. He had seen everything that God had created. And he wakes up and there's this beautiful woman sitting in front of him. This is where we get the word woman from. Adam looks up and he goes, whoa, 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 man. He goes, woman. And that's where we get the word woman from. Some of you guys will catch on that a little bit later. He was awestruck. He said, God, you love me so much. He said, you never wanted me to be lonely, but God, you wanted to give me a partner in life. And I want to tell you what, this was the first and only perfect couple in the history of the world. You see, there was no sin. There was no sadness. There was no lying, no jealousy, no heartache. But then all of a sudden, Satan comes to Eve. And he begins to lie to her. Now, I want you to notice something, how, how Satan always comes to us. And this is the way that Satan really begins to attack us. He goes, he said to uh, Eve, he goes, God didn't really say that. You see, Satan always wants to take truth, and he wants to twist it and turn it into a lie. And as he comes to Eve, he said, God didn't say that you can't really eat of any of the trees. No, God didn't say we couldn't eat of any of the trees. He said we could only not eat of one tree. And then he says, you know what, Eve, I believe God's lying to you. He goes, you're not really going to die if you eat of the fruit of the tree. You see, I want you to understand something. Satan wasn't tempting Eve to be like him. He began tempting Adam and Eve to be like God. You see, Satan doesn't try to tempt us just to do pure evil. He tries to attempt us to be something that we're not. And he comes to Eve and he goes, he goes God's just holding out on you. He said, because if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will be like God. You'll have all kinds of power. He said, you'll be able to do things you never thought you'd been able to do. He goes, if you just do this, he said, you'll be just like God. And so they were tempted. They were tempted, listen to this, to be the God of their own life. You see, God created us like this. But all of a sudden, we become tempted to be the God of our own life. God, you created me just like this, perfect and whole. But we begin to think, God, I know what's best for my life. And, and then, God, I can make my own decisions. And I tell you, every time we start doing that, we always fall flat on our face. This morning, I really want us to look at God's word in Genesis chapter 3 when we talk about relationships. Genesis chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, and we're going to be in verses 6 through 19. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 19. And the scripture reads this way. So Eve ate of some of the fruit. Then she also gave some to her husband Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Immediately their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame. And I want you to circle that word shame right there in your scripture. Suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover up themselves. Then they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So they hid from God among the trees. But God called out to Adam, Where are you? Adam replied, I heard you coming, so I was afraid. I want you to circle that word afraid in your scriptures. Because I was naked, so I hid. Then God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam said, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it. Then Eve said, then God said to Eve, why did you do this? Eve replied, the, certain, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So God said to Eve, because you have disobeyed me, you'll have greater trouble and pregnancy and great pain in childbirth and though you desire your husband he's going to lord it over you then God said to Adam because you have disobeyed me and sinned with your wife the ground you work is now cursed and though you'll get to eat what you have planted your fields will have weeds and thorns and thistles for the rest of your life so that you will sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourself return to the dirt that I have used to create you. 
You see, today I want you to look at the relational truths in this story. There are three fundamental fears that as we look at the truth of this story right here today that damage every relationship. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture today, not just between Adam and Eve, but every single relationship of your life. And these three things are really what ruin our relationships. I want to ask you this question in your outline today. How is it that fear ruins your relationship? Number one in your outline says this. My fear of exposure makes me distant. My fear of exposure makes me distant. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is it that I can't get close to people in my life? Has there ever been a point in your life where you feel like that you are always holding people at an arm's length away? That you're really scared to let people get in close to you? You see, there's a lot about you that you don't like, and you don't want people to see the real you. We'll let them see a little bit of us, and we'll let them get a little bit close to us, but how many times in our life have we been really afraid to let people get really close to us? And the reason for this is because you don't accept certain things in your own life. You don't accept certain things in your own life about you. Maybe it's your faults. Maybe it's your failures or your weaknesses. And you're sitting there and you're saying, you know what? I'm not too sure I really want to let people get close to me. And this is exactly what began in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And it says, God called it to Adam, why are you hiding? And remember what I told you circling your scripture? Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. You see, whenever God asks us a question, I want you to understand something. God already knows the answer. God already knew exactly where Adam was. God knew exactly what Adam had done. He was simply asking Adam this question for Adam's own benefit. He wanted Adam to really man up right here and say, you know what, God? I was hiding because I sinned. That's what God was asking Adam their question for. I want you to understand something. Some of you are going through things in your life. You're struggling in your relationships. Maybe it's with God. Maybe it's with another person. Maybe it's in your relational life with your spouse. And you know what? There is never any recovery as long as you're still living in denial. If you say there's no problem, guess what? You can never have the problem solved in your life. You have to own up to it. Adam said, I was afraid and I hid. Fear always causes us to hide. When we have fear in our life, fear of whatever it is, we tend to want to isolate ourselves and we want to tend to go into hiding and say, you know what, God, I'm just going to stay back here kind of by myself. I don't really want to let anybody in. I don't want to let anybody close to me, God. All right, now, I just want to pretend that there's no problem here. And we go on living our lives trying to pretend, hey, there's not even a problem here. When the truth of the matter is, we're overwhelmed. As the truth of the matter is, we're, we're saying, you know what, God? Because I'm exposed, God, I feel distant to you, God. And we try to hide. You see, but God wants us to face their problems so we can be their problem. In the scripture, Adam said this. He said, I was naked and I was afraid. Now, I, I want you to talk about this term nakedness right here. He's not talking about him just being physically naked. Although we're physically naked, we're totally exposed. That's a, that's a very vulnerable position. When you ever have to go to a doctor for a checkup and he tells you, put on this little gown and you look at this gown and it's all the way open in the back and you're going, this isn't a gown, this thing right here won't cover nothing. I need four of these to cover my body. You know, there, there's a sense of, there's a sense of a, a, a vulnerableness there. And we're like, God, I'm not too sure about this. But God's not talking about just a physical nakedness here. As a matter of fact, he's talking about emotional exposure. You see, when we're exposed, sometimes we feel unprotected. Our hearts feel vulnerable. You see, but it's really in these positions that we're truly authentic and we're out in the open. But we allow fear to come in and to expose us. If we don't turn to God, you know what we're going to do? We're going to become distant from God and we're going to try to hide from God and we're going to try to hide from people. I don't want them to know how I really think. I don't want them to know how I really feel. God, I'm going to put on this mask, and I'm going to smile, and God, I'm going to act like everything's okay. And God, I just won't think about it, and God, I'm just going to keep moving on. But the truth of the matter is, 
we have to understand something. God already knows everything. God wants to use our brokenness to heal us. Sometimes it's through our brokenness God doesn't just heal us, but he heals other people. God wants to use what you're going through right now in your life to be a testimony. In verse 7, it says, in the first part it says, they suddenly felt ashamed of their nakedness. Now I want you to understand there's, there's three phases right here that, that we go through when we're exposed. The first phase, and I, I don't know if I even wrote this in your outline. Yeah, actually, I did. The first phase in your outline, it says this, is the phase of fear is shame. The first phase of fear is shame. You see, when you carry shame, you're easily embarrassed. This is a symptom when we carry unresolved fear. Shame says that I'm easily, easily mortified. I'm easily feel fear. I easily feel upset. I easily feel shame. When we have fear in our life and all of a sudden something happens, we feel the shame in our life that I can't let people know this. I can't let people know that. I, I'm supposed to be this way. We have in our minds, the world has told us we're supposed to be this way. We're supposed to act this way. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do that. You know what God says we're supposed to do? To love him, trust him, and lean on him. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be in a loving relationship with the Lord. You know what, church? We don't have it all together. But God does. The second thing, the second phase is this. The second phase is the cover-up. You see, we realize we don't have it all together, so then what happens a lot of times in our life, just like Adam and Eve did, we begin to try to cover up things in our life. In verse 7b, it says this, So they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves up. Now, I'm going to tell you what, fig leaves are not very big. That would have been a lot of fig leaves to start sewing together. That's a whole lot of cover-up, if you understand what I'm saying. A lot of us in our life, we have a lot of little leaves that we're trying to cover up a lot of junk with. And so we work so hard trying to cover everything up because we don't want people to see the real us because we're ashamed. We have fear. We're trying to cover it up. So they took these fig leaves and they began to sew them together. You see, we use fig leaves all the time, but we use them in different ways. Some people use fig leaves as humor. Everything's just a joke even though they're hurting. Some people use sarcasm. Some people try to use their bank accounts to make them feel better. You see, really, we try to have this image. We try to cover ourselves up with the right clothes, with the right look, the right car, the right words to say at the right time. And we try to hide behind all these things. Have you ever noticed people online it seems like they're trying to hide behind a certain image that's not real. You take 50 or 60 pictures just to post that one good one. We sit there and we look at all these pictures and look how many selfies are taken and go, scroll through, the, this is the one right here. Uh, look at me, I'm here, you're not. And we, we live in this selfie generation right now. Everybody wants to make everybody think that everything's perfect, but the truth of the matter is we live in a broken world. The truth of the matter is we need Jesus. God is the only perfect thing, and we're broken people, and I want to tell you something, we're in need of a holy God. The third phase is distance from God. You see, so first they already try to cover up everything. They already try to cover up their sin, and they say, you know, this cover up isn't doing too good, so the next thing is maybe we should go hide from God. And verse 80 says, then they hid from God among the trees. They hid from God because they were afraid. And they were scared. You see, they were disconnected from God. And we get afraid and we get scared. We disconnect from God and other people. And can I tell you something? Satan always wants to have you afraid. He always wants to have you live in shame. He always wants to have you live in distance. This is why. If Satan can isolate you, Satan can defeat you. When you're at the lowest points of your life, can I tell you something? You do not need isolation. You need people. And I'm speaking from experience. When we're at the lowest places of our life, 
We need people around us more than ever. Our natural instinct is to say, you know what? I don't want to deal with this. I want to be quiet. I want to get as far away from the situation as I can. I, 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 God, I just want to be alone. But what we're really saying is I don't want to deal with anything. And God said, you know, right now, he goes, I'm building a testimony. And God says, I'm going to use everything in your life. He goes, don't go and hide. He said, but run to me. But you see, that's what we want to do so many times. We want to run and we want to hide. Number two in our outline says this. My fear of disapproval makes me defensive. So all of a sudden, we, we, we go from hiding and running to all of a sudden we start accusing others. You see, have you ever noticed that uh, little people belittle other people? So when we're, we're feeling bad about ourselves, have you ever noticed, we, we all do this, let's be honest, we go, well, they're not really that great. It's not really that big of a deal. Oh, they think highly of them, so I don't really like that car anyways, even though I've wanted one all my life. Uh, have you ever noticed we do that? We, 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 we start uh, saying, you know what, well, they're, they're not really that great, it's not really that big of a deal. And so what happens is we start from going from running and hiding from God to accusing. I, I want you to look at this. We move from excusing, hey, it's not a big deal, to accusing. And this is what happens, then we start to attack other people. This is exactly what Adam and Eve did. We start pointing fingers at everyone. You see, the more critical a person is, the more critical a person is, the more you know that they fear disapproval. Have you ever been around somebody who's always critical? Can I be honest with you? They have a problem. Because they're afraid of disapproval in their own lives. And I, I, want, I want to tell you something today, and, and this is something God's continuing to teach me. When somebody's always critical of you or what's going on around you or other people, they're not angry with you. They're struggling with their own problems. When people are being critical, don't get upset and mad at them. Pray for them. Because, you see, they're having their own spiritual battle. You know, and I, I learned a long time ago at, when I, when, as a pastor, I'm never going to please everybody, and that's okay. I'm going to do what God's called me to do, and I'm going to love people. And some people are going to like different things, and some people won't like different things, and that's okay. You know what? God's called us to love each other and to love him. But see, this is what Adam and Eve did in Genesis 3, 11, and 12. God asked, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam answered, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit. So God, I want you to understand something. This is your fault, not mine. God, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit. And all of a sudden, our lives start getting out of a line. You see, we want to cast blame on somebody else. Adam took it like a man, didn't he? Let me go blame my wife. You know, kids, I know you really wanted to go to Disney this year, but your mom said we couldn't do it. How many times have we said stuff and done stuff like that? Let's be honest. We, we, we want to go and blame somebody else because, you know, we don't want to feel secure. We don't want to feel ashamed. We don't want to feel bad. So we'll cast the blame on somebody else. Well, you know, the church service wouldn't have been so bad if this wouldn't have happened today. It would, this wouldn't have happened if, if this wouldn't have happened. And we never want to take the blame ourselves. God, I'll be closer to you if it weren't for this woman you gave me to marry. It's really her fault, God. Can I tell you something? You are as close to God as you choose to be. That is your choice. It's nobody else's fault how close you are to God or how far away you are from God. Because I'm going to tell you, when you begin to get on your knees and you begin to cry out to God and you pour your heart to God and you lay it all out on the mat, I'm going to tell you what, that's you and God, not you and somebody else. And I'm going to tell you, God will show up in your time of need, and he will show off. And I'm going to tell you what, Adam says, you know, God, hey, this is not really my fault. And God said, oh, big boy, it is yours. You see, he was passing the responsibility. And then we go to Eve. Then Eve said, the snake tricked me into eating. You see, now Eve's blaming a snake. She immediately gets defensive. 
God, I don't know why you put this snake in the garden. God, why would you allow the devil in here? You see, we always want to blame somebody else. You know why? Because when we're afraid of disapproval, we begin to become defensive. When you see somebody who's very defensive, they're afraid of disapproval. Many times the reason we fear disapproval is because we know we've done something wrong. Number three in your outline says this. My fear of losing control makes me more demanding. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. And and what happens is when somebody feels out of control, they try to control every single thing in their life. Can Can I tell you how that is? We start saying, you know what, well, I'm going to take control of this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do the other. And what happens is we're saying, God, I don't trust you enough, God, to control the situation. So, God, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it all together. I'll put it in place for you, God, and then you can bless it. And, God, once you bless it, then it'll be okay because I've got this under control. And the more out of control we are, the more we become controlling. Can I tell you what happens? The more out of control we get. Because then we have stress and pressures and all these different things. And what happens is the more out of control we begin to get, we start getting demanding. We start trying to protect ourselves. We start trying to dominate other people and other things. And the more insecure you are, the more trolling you could become. And you get more and more insecure. And insecure people become more demanding and more controlling. Why does this happen? It's all because of the result of sin. Many people are living in fear and shame right now because of the result of sin in their life. Now, I I want to be real with you this morning. You can't blame Adam and Eve for what's going on in your life right now. You see, the sin that we're dealing with we, originally, we recognize the original sin came from Adam and Eve. We've preached about it for the last two weeks. We've preached about the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our life that wants to sanctify us and to set us apart and to live lives as holy people. We've talked about how Jesus Christ died on that old rugged cross and by his blood, he said, he washed away all of our sin. But see, we have a choice to make that we must die daily to Christ. And if we're having these fears and all these emotions and all these different things are going on in our life, I want you to understand something. This is where sin has come into our lives. In verse 16, it says, talking about Adam and Eve right here, and you're talking about the result. This is the result of Adam and Eve's sin. This is what it says. You will have a yearning for your husband, Eve, but he will lord it over you. He will dominate you. This is where the conflict between men and women begin right in the garden. This is the result of sin. There was no cooperating, but competing. Couples stop fighting each other and fight for each other. You see, today we want to look at this antidote of sin. God, what do I do with the sin in my life that wants to make me competing instead of cooperating with you, cooperating with others? Because you see, This was the uh, original relationship that we find in the garden that was perfect that all of a sudden got destroyed because of sin. Now, this same relationship we're talking about right here and the same fears and the same struggles that we go through are not just with your spouse. It's with your coworkers. Some of you guys, it's with your children. Some of us with a friend that we're trying to keep people at arm's length. But today, I want to talk to you about the antidote to the sin. The antidote is this. We learn to live in God's love. In 1 John 4, 18, it says this, Whenever God, Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out all fear. Can I get an amen this morning? I, I, I want to read this passage of scripture to you again. In 1 John 4, 18a, Where God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out all fear. Fear and love cannot live in the same place. If you want to remove fear, get God's love where you have fear. Maybe it's in your job. 
Maybe it's in your marital relationship. Maybe it's in your health. You see, love is greater than any fear. I want you to think about this for a moment. How many times have you seen the images on TV, there's a burning building, and the people are standing around outside and nobody's going in. But all of a sudden you may see a father or you see a mother all of a sudden go running to this burning building, trying to kick down doors, go through windows, whatever it takes. You know why they do that? Because they have a child that's inside that building. And their love for that child is much greater than any fear of being hurt. You see, I want you to understand that the love is greater than any fear that we can have. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, in the second part of that, it says, it is the thought of punishment, I'm talking about negative consequences, that makes a person fearful. You see, but when we stop thinking about the negative, and we begin to think about the positive, then God, you are love. God, you promised that you would fight for me, God. You promised that you would never leave me, that you would never forsake me. God, I can stand upon the promises of your word. Think about it. How many times have you in your life been afraid to tell the truth? Think about it. Have you ever been in your life, there's situations that you really just seem like you're afraid to tell the truth? Maybe you're afraid to be yourself. Maybe you've been afraid to say what you think. Then there's some of you guys that have never been afraid to say what you think and probably should have been. How many times do we hold back because we don't want to say something because we're afraid to hurt somebody's feelings? You know what love is? It's caring enough about a person to tell them the truth even if it does hurt their feelings. You see, I'm more concerned about your eternity than making you like me. I'm more concerned about telling you the truth and the importance of living a lifestyle and ho- of holiness and sharing hope and truth with you guys than I am you liking me. You see, there's times in our life that people are going to ask us questions. They want you to give them a certain answer. And we tell them just enough truth to make them happy, but we don't tell them the whole truth. Can I tell you something? That's called a lie. You see, we're to love people. And we're to tell them, say, you know what? I want to tell you the whole truth simply because I love you. If you will do these three things in your life, it will transform every one of your relationships. Number one in your outline says this. Every day I surrender my heart to God. Every day I surrender it all to you, God. My mind, we preached about that. My emotions and my heart, God, I surrender it all to you. The closer you get to God, the more love you're going to feel in your heart. You see, the closer you get to God, the more fear you're going to have removed. Some of you right now, you have some great fears in your life. As a matter of fact, it seems like the fear has begun to dominate your life. And you don't know how to handle it. Can I tell you the truth? You, of yourself, would never know how to handle it. Only God can. You see, it's only God who can give us peace in the midst of a storm. That through his love, he can calm us. He can give us peace. He can give us joy. I want you to write this verse down. Some of you, everybody in here to write this verse down. Some of you guys really need this verse. And this is from the contemporary English version. And it's Job 11, 13 through 18. And it says this, surrender your heart to God, turn to him in prayer, and give up your sin. Now, there's three things right here we're to do. I want you to understand this, and I'm not going to preach the whole message on this this morning, but I could. 
But there's three things right here. It says, first of all, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sin. So first of all, it says, God, my heart belongs to you. God, I'm turning to you in prayer because I, I recognize, Lord, how much I need you. And God, I want you to remove any sin that's in my life. And then the scripture goes on to say, it says, even, though, even those sins that are done in secret. It says, then, this is the promise from God. Once we do this, this is God's promise. He goes, you will not be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. And this is maybe some of you guys where you're at today. I know this is where I'm at. Your troubles will go away like water beneath the bridge. Your darkest night will be brighter than noon. And I love this promise. Then you will rest safe and be secure, filled with hope. And emptied of worry. Can I tell you something? That's where I'm at in my life right now. My personal life right now hasn't been very easy. You know, we had prayer here Wednesday night. You know, we received word that Sawyer has three tumors in his brain. The first few days were very hard days, just kind of comprehending all this. What does this mean, God? Fear, worry, concern. But how quickly it moved to trust, faith, hope. And how God empties our worries. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your prayers. We received, received so many messages. It's unbelievable. People praying literally all around the world. We've had messages as far as Thailand of people who literally are praying around the world for our family right now. We're so blessed because of that. If you had asked me Wednesday how I was going to get up here and preach, I would have told you I had no clue if I could. But this morning I had such a desire to share God's word. We're expecting a miracle. We're expecting a testimony, church. Can I tell you what? It wasn't because of my faith. Because my son, he climbed in my bed Wednesday night and said, Dad, I have perfect peace. He said, I can't explain it. I said, God just gives me peace. And I opened up God's word. I said, buddy, that comes from Galatians 4, 7. That God would give us peace that transcends all understanding. How about come unglued? <laughs> you know why? My God's in control. We don't just preach this stuff. We live it. This is a God at work in our heart and our lives. This is what he says. Right, God. This is our promise. Your troubles will go away like water beneath the bridge. And in your darkest night, be brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. Can I tell you something? There's no greater place to be than in the hands of an almighty God. And, and this to see God continue to work and to do miracles. And, 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 and I, you know, every phone call, I'll be honest with you, you, you feel like you're on edge. You know, Friday we were sitting there towards the end of Friday evening and uh, Stacy and I are sitting there together and we, we, we got a phone call and it's, it's the imaging center. We've already had two MRIs, and you're always scared when you get the next phone call. We got two more MRIs Monday, and they said, we're sorry, we can't do your MRIs. We're going to have to reschedule them because we have a problem with insurance. They don't understand why they need so many MRIs, and, and this is going to delay you guys probably to Friday to have your MRIs, so you'll miss your, your, your appointment on Tuesday with a neurosurgeon. And we're sitting there, and I said, Stacey, we just got to pray. And during that time, we got a text from one of the ladies here in the church. She said, uh, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you, and how can we pray for you specifically? And we immediately responded back, please pray for us that we won't miss our appointments. So 
the doctor's office, they had left early for the day because it was Friday and they leave early. Called to the lady at insurance, she told us to call somebody at the doctor's office. We called back and forth and we just prayed. You won't hear me complain about people in insurance. This little lady worked her backside off to help us. The doctor's office did a lot to help us. The lady called us back. She says, we got the approvals that we needed. She said, everything's fine. That may not be seen big to some people, but that was huge for us. You see, we see God working. And we're expecting God to continue to move. So that brings us to the second point of this message. It says this. Every day remember the way that God loves me. You see, even if you don't feel that you're loved, you are being loved. And I I want you to look at, at, at the ways that God loves you. And look at how God feels about you. When we think about how God sees us, first of all, I want you to understand something. When we're a child of God, and we've asked Jesus Christ to come into our life, We belong to him. We're his child. And God loves us more than we can begin to even imagine. But I want you to understand this about yourself when you look at God. First of all is this in your outline. I'm completely accepted. The deepest wounds of your life comes from rejection. No matter who you are or what you do, Not everybody in life is going to like you. Don't worry about their approval. Can I tell you something? We, especially we're teenagers and we're young, and even as adults, we do this too. So we 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 talk about teenagers so we don't feel bad about ourselves. We do the same thing. We worry about people rejecting us all the time. What are they going to think about this? What are they going to say about this? What are they going to think about the clothes I'm wearing, the car I'm driving, the house I live in? What are they going to think about the neighborhood? Oh, I've got to go to this reunion. Are they going to think I gained too much weight? Or maybe I, I don't have enough hair, or maybe my hair is the wrong color. I need to darken up. And we have all these insecurities. Let's be honest. And we think about all these things. Can I tell you something? Stop worrying about the approval of other people. They're too busy worried about Facebook if everybody else approves of them. How many likes did I get today? Did they like this? They, they, don't, they're worried about their own selves. Don't worry about people. The only approval you'll ever need in your life is the approval of God. He is the only one that matters. And you know what God said? He goes, I accept you and I love you. He goes, you are my child. You know why God accepts us? Titus 3, 7. It says this. Jesus made us acceptable to God. Think about that for just a moment. We were bought with a price we could never pay. In my sin and the ugliness of my life, and the more that God examines me, the more I realize I need to give to God. The more I know about myself, the more I don't like myself. And I say, God, I want to be more like you. And I was not worthy to come to Christ. None of us are. But you know what God says? Because my son, he paid a price that you could never pay. He said that, You can come to me, and I completely accept you. You know why? He said, because all the ugliness was washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And I want to tell you something. You may know people that you say, Pastor, uh, they're out of their mind. Pastor, these people, they're, they're, they're such rogues. They don't love Jesus. There's no hope for them. Can I tell you something? There is hope for everybody as long as there's breath in their life. You know why? Because Jesus Christ does miracles. If Jesus can save somebody like me, he can save anybody. If Jesus can save somebody like you, he can save anybody. I I want you to know this. Don't feel so self-righteous about yourself. Because God knows your hearts and your deepest, darkest thoughts. And none of us would like that plate up here on this screen. I can tell you that right now. And God says, I love you that much. If I can forgive you, he said, I can forgive anybody. You see, the God above all loves and accepts you as his child. One of my favorite scriptures says that we're a royal priesthood. Now, we talk about being a royal priesthood. You know what God says? He said, you literally have royal blood that runs through your veins. 
the blood of God is running through your veins. All of a sudden, he goes, I'm the God who breathed life into you. I brought you from death to life. He goes, and now, he goes, I've placed you into my family. I've adopted you into the priesthood. He goes, you are a child of the king. So when Satan comes after you and he tells you, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, God must not love you. He's allowing you to go through this valley. You say, oh, no, no, Satan. God is protecting me. God is stretching me. God is helping me grow. And God is going to protect me. You know why? Because I'm his child. God has a plan for me and everything. And my job is simply to do this, to follow him. You see, in Isaiah 54, 10, it says, My love for you never end, says the Lord. This is how also God loves you. He says, he loves us unconditionally. I'm unconditionally loved by God. Second in your outline right here in this point. God's love is consistent. God's love never changes. God's love is unconditional. No one will ever love you more than God loves you. You can't work hard enough to get God's love. You can't be good enough. I'm just going to be very honest with you. I've been on my knees and my face before God all week long saying, God, what have I done wrong? God, can I do something different? God says, Shannon, I love you. He said, I love you because of who I am, not because of who you are. He said, the only thing I ask for you to do is live in obedience. And I said, God, I, I will share your word. God, I will be obedient to you in everything. God, the only place I can ask to be is in your hand. God, I ask for your anointing to be upon me and my family and my church. God, I ask for your grace to go before me. That's the only things we can ask for, church. Number three, it says, I'm totally forgiven. You see, God chose to love us from the very beginning. In Romans 8, 1, it says, there's no condemnation in those who love Christ Jesus. Next in our outline, it says, I'm considered extremely vulnerable. How much do you think you're worth? Think about that for a moment. Now, I'm not talking about your wealth and how much money you have in a bank, but your self-worth. You see, the value depends upon who owns it and what someone is willing to pay for it. Think about that for a moment. If I were to bring my toothbrush in here and goes, how many of you guys want to buy my toothbrush? Most of you guys would laugh and be like, that thing's old and ugly. Let's get it out of here. But if I was to bring a really nice toothbrush in here and say, hey, this was owned by Elvis Presley. Some of you guys say, hey, I'd like to have that. I'm willing to pay a lot of money for it. Or maybe it was owned by somebody else. You see, value is always in two things. When we look at value, it's, the value depends on who owns it or who it was owned by, who owns it, and what somebody's willing to pay for it. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. You are a son or you're a daughter of the king. Think about how valuable you are. God gave his very best, his son, to die on a rugged cross for you. Your value is not in you, but it's in Jesus Christ who died for you. That makes you pretty valuable. God said, I was willing to give everything that I may be in a relationship with him. In 1 Corinthians 7, 23, it says, You have been bought and paid for by Christ's death. Jesus gave the greatest price ever for you. So thirdly, in closing this morning is this. Every day, offer that same love to others. Jesus said to us to love others as I have commanded you, as I have loved you. This is his command. He said, I've loved you and I've commanded you to love everybody else. In Romans 15, 7, it says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Now, I want you to understand something. God says, I loved you, so you're to love other people. So that means our relationships have to change. We have to start taking down walls. And being vulnerable. We have to stop holding people at a arm's length and let them in. You know why? So they can see our hearts. So 
so your accountability partner can know where your heart's at, so lost people can see your heart, so Jesus can place compassion in your heart, so he can place love in your heart. You know what God wants to do? He wants to totally, radically change your life. You know, I was walking through life thinking everything was just fine. God, I'm doing what you've called me to do. I'm enjoying life. God, you've blessed me. You know what God did? He said, I want to turn your life upside down so you can trust me more. He said, I want you to have a deeper relationship with me than you've ever had in your life. God says, do you trust me? He's asking you that question today. Do you trust me? Pastor George called me Monday evening. We were talking and asked me how I was doing. I'd just gotten back with Sawyer Monday evening. We found everything out. And one of the things I told Sawyer, I said, Sawyer, I said, I remember um, very clearly when you were a little boy. Your mom and I walked to the front of the sanctuary where I'm standing at right now. We dedicated you to God. And you're in God's hand. God's much greater than we are. I was a wreck. I didn't have a lot of peace. <laughs> but on Wednesday, my son reminded me of the faith that we're supposed to have. And I've been blessed with three great boys. Every one of them. And then I was reminded of God's love in 1 Corinthians. This is out of God's word version. It says, love never stops. Be patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. Be strong. Somebody sent me a verse today. It reminded me out of Joshua. It said, be strong and courageous. And you know what? I believe God's calling us to be strong and courageous in him. There's some of you in here right now in your life that you know it. You've been struggling for a while. You've been struggling with relationships. You will never ever have your relationships right this way. Your relationships 100% right this way. And that means surrendering it all to God. That means being completely vulnerable. We can't sew fig leaves together and hide from God. We can't put a smile on our face and just walk in and say everything's okay. It's like painting a house that's falling apart on the inside because of termites. It may look good on the outside, but the whole foundation is crumbling. You may look good in pictures. You may have the right clothes, the right words to say. It's kind of like when I started first coming to church when I was a teenager, when I first started coming back to church. I went to church long enough to know the right words to say, the right things to do in front of people. But I was so lost. You see, we start trying to hide ourselves. Then we distance ourselves. We know what to say around people, things to do, but we distance ourselves from God. Can I, can I be honest with you guys this morning? And I don't want you to raise your hand. How much time are you spending in God's Word? And don't tell me that you're too busy. If you're too busy to be in God's Word, you're simply too busy. You've heard that said a million times, and that's so cliche. But can I tell you why you're too busy? It's because you want distance from God. Because when we're in God's word, it's God's word that changes us. It's God's word that searches our hearts. It's God's word, word that sees if there's any wicked ways in us. And we can know all the right words. We can come to church every Sunday. 
We can do all the extra things. But where is my relationship really with God this morning? Are you still sowing fig leaves? Are you still hiding in the trees? See, the truth of the matter is for some of you this morning, you've gotten really good at it. You're so good at it that not only do other people believe that lie, but you believe it yourself. Can I tell you, there's been times in my life that I felt that way. That God, I've got it all together, but the truth of the matter was, I had nothing together. As a matter of fact, the more I learn from God, the more I learn that I need Him more and more every day. Not every day is easy. But with God, every day is a good day. This morning, I I just believe God wants to begin a revival in our church. I truly believe that. The revival will never happen in this church or this country or anywhere unless it begins in your own life. Some of you guys have been distant for too long. I'd hate to even say how many people probably are so distant from God. But I believe there's a lot more than just a couple in this sanctuary. For a long time, we've been at arm's length. We've enjoyed the blessings of God. We've enjoyed the things of God. But we haven't really enjoyed God himself. I've been guilty. My desire to be closer to God than I ever have in my life. This morning, I'm going to ask our praise team to come forward as we get ready to close in prayer. And we have enough room around this sanctuary that maybe you want to come to an altar or just turn around and kneel in your seat. But with no distractions today. And maybe you're on the praise team and you need to come to this altar. That's fine, too. I want you to stand with me this morning as we get ready to close. This is just you and God this morning. Unless you need somebody to pray with, if you need somebody to pray with you, come get me, come grab Pastor George or Caleb or somebody. Uh, Pastor Greg's not here today, one of our board members or whoever. If you need somebody to pray with you, find one of us. But this is really more about today, about between you and God. Maybe you've been distant. Sowing fig leaves, hiding in the trees. But God says, I love you unconditionally. And he's calling us into him. Would you come this morning? Without a moment's delay, we're not going to wait. Would you come? Just start coming now. This, this, we want revival. We want God to move. Is it about what anybody else thinks or anybody else says? Would you come this morning? He's worthy of every song you could ever sing. He's worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
He's worthy of every song we could ever sing. He's worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever sing. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like. I will build my life upon your love because you're the firm foundation. That's where we all have to start. And if you don't have that foundation, it's like building on sand. Eventually, the house, the whole house is going to crumble down. So this morning, um, as we go back through that, I want you to just have that in your mind, that image. And I want you to really ask yourself this morning, is my foundation with the Lord or is it somewhere else? I will build my life, see it. Yes, I will build my life upon your love. upon 
beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are. Lord, fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. As we close in prayer this morning, uh, I have to ask you to remember the Byers family and as we have the service tonight that God would just move. God works in all things. And tonight, we don't know how many young people or people be here tonight that haven't heard the message, the message of hope. And I pray that same sweet anointing that's here this morning, may it be here tonight. There may be people that really don't understand or know the gospel. Their lives will be eternally changed. I challenge you this week as you go home and you count your blessings that you praise God that you get alone in your prayer closets wherever that may be as you seek the face of God asking God what am I hiding what am I holding back God may I give it all to you God would you begin a revival in me let's pray together Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the sweet, sweet presence of your Spirit. Father God, we need your anointing more than we need anything this world has to offer. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will bear witness to our hearts and our minds and our souls that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, that your word will become more and more alive to us than ever. That we would seek your face. Lord, that as we read your word, that we would be still, we would be quiet, and we would listen. And Father God, would you use us to share that same love that you've given us to a lost and a dying world. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.